Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Varelli, founder and CEO of Project Purple and the host of the Project Purple Podcast. We have another interview for you coming up with a very special guest after a few quick updates. We're already three quarters of the way through 2023, and we are on pace to have another record year, which is just amazing. Last year was our best year ever, and I just want to thank everyone who has supported, donated, or participated in a Project Purple event up until this point in time. It's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> just reading this, we've launched many of our 2024 teams, and we still have you know, uh, a quarter left here in 2023. But uh, we've launched our London 2024 team, which I think is close to being sold out. Um, our Boston 2024 team, which we are excited to be back as an official charity partner for the Boston Marathon, um, as well as many other races like our Kofax Marathon, our Chicago 2024 team. Um, with Boston, this now makes us an official charity partner of five of the world's largest marathons. So many of our other 2024 races will be launching very soon. To learn more about all these great events, visit our website at projectpurple.org and make sure to, to follow us on social media to stay up to date on all things Project Purple. Without further ado, let's meet our special guest today, someone that I've had the uh, fortunate ability to get to know and meet over the last couple months, but culinary nutritionist, author, and founder of WT Fork, Stephanie Sachs. Welcome to the Project Purple podcast, Stephanie. Thank you, Dino. I was listening to your intro, and um, I think we're going to all do the turkey trot here in Montauk. So I love it. So yeah, we'll join that. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We uh, we launched the turkey trot in the COVID year. And we had just a, an insane response to it. And then we brought it back year after year. And as physical races came back on the, you know, to the, to the surface, um, people just, there was a, there's an appetite for it. It's a great way to build awareness. And it's just awesome to see people from all over the country running in these local 5Ks. I mean, I guess the, the turkey trot has become synonymous with Thanksgiving now, right? Over the last like, 10 years. Completely, completely. Which is, you know, I guess just a segue here, um, you know, running to me, when I started running, I was like, wait a minute, like running's healthy. Yes, you go run. And then at the finish line, they hand you that cold beverage, which is usually a beer or something, you know, and I'm like, wait or a minute. Or a Gatorade. Yeah which is both counter to being healthy. Right. And oh, so man. now, so now like the Turkey trots, I feel have that same thing. It's like people who don't run normally on Thanksgiving will run and they'll be like, Oh, well I earned that pie. I earned that extra, you know, gravy. I earned <laughs> those sweets because I ran this morning, but it's all good. You know, it's getting people out being physically active, you know, is always a positive. Just got to watch what you put back into your body, which we're going to talk about here. This yeah. is a, I'm really excited to have you on. I know, as I mentioned in the intro, we've gotten to know each other over the last couple of months, um, you know, and, and what is always customary here on the podcast is we always, that first segment is always the guest opportunity to kind of share their story, their background, um, because some people may not know who you are. I know our audience here, we, we've done some stuff with you with our survivor group. So our survivors listening probably know who you are, but there's a lot of other people. And I'm just really excited because what we're going to talk about today, food and nutrition is something for me personally that I've kind of, you know, since I started Project Purple and as the years have gone on, as I became an athlete, I like to use that term like I'm an athlete. I'm not like a professional athlete, but as I began to do more and more endurance events, nutrition became such an important piece to it. The first marathon, the first couple of marathons, I think it took me about like four marathons to kind of figure out like, hey, like you're out there for four and a half hours. You really need to like refuel your body and how much of an importance that it became. But then as we've grown as an organization, and you know, this is now 13 years. There's been more and more data from the science community stating like the effects of certain foods and how that plays out in disease prevention, disease progression, and also treatment during, you know, fighting cancer, how that impacts your treatment, good, bad. And, and so 
I'm excited because we're going to go down this this road here of, of nutrition and food and and for people that are healthy, for people that are battling. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to you first to kind of give your background and, and kind of your story, how you got started and, and a little bit more than, you know, the, the quick intro that I gave you as, as your titles and everything that you got behind you. So with that, the microphone is yours and uh, you can stay oh, as high you. level as you want, or you can go as deep <laughs> as you want. I always tell our guests. Um, God, I can go really deep, but uh, <laughs> I think, I think I will stay middle ground. Um, this is not just a job. I'm a culinary nutritionist. So I'm a health supportive chef first or health support or health supportive cook first. I went to culinary school and studied with Anne-Marie Colbin um, and some of the leaders in the food as medicine movement in the 90s at the Natural Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts. And then I went on to Teachers College to get my master's in nutrition education and a lot of other letters after my name. Um, that's my professional training, but how I got there was that I was a kid who loved to cook. Um, it was one of the, uh, healthy things that we did in my house. Uh, food was always healthy and we cooked, um, as a family oftentimes, and it was just a passion. And unfortunately I, was physically sick a lot as a kid. So at eight, asthma onset, um, terrible allergies, like paralytic allergies where I couldn't breathe. Um, I had recurring pneumonia, recurring bronchitis, and I just could not get out of my way physically. Little did I know at that time that uh, there were, you know, the physical responses were, were, as a result of emotional challenges that were going on in my upbringing. And um, my body was keeping the score, thanks to Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, uh, who wrote a book, The Body Keeps the Score. I now have some understanding as to um, the nuances of my story. But basically, I turned to food. At the age of 16, I started cooking in a health food store in Montauk, New York, as my summer job. And I started to look at everything that I was eating. And I was in an environment where I could not control what was going on around me per se, but what I could control was what I put in my body. And so I started to advocate for myself. I started to read voraciously as a teenager. I started to make different choices about food. I started to cook for myself differently than my family was cooking. While my friends were asking for, you know, Coke with Twizzler straws uh, to suck down that beverage, I was, you know, looking at ingredient labels and asking questions about the chickens and how they were raised. And I was the food freak. It was really hard. I was different. People made fun of me, including my family. But I felt better physically. I felt better. And that was helping me feel better mentally. And so I stayed on this path um, through my teenage years, uh, through disordered eating, anorexic, bulimia. I had it all. Um, responses, again, to some of the challenges that I was up against. But I was determined to heal and to help myself. So I got educated and went to college, took myself off the meal plan, lived in a suite, cooked in my dorm room. This was in the 80s, um, the late 80s, the early 90s. And really did not think that this was something that I would or could pursue as a profession. It was my passion. But after spending years sort of floundering in the advertising and marketing world, I was like, you know what? I want to do what I love and love what I do. And I want to teach people how to do for themselves what I've been able to do for myself. So while I couldn't change certain circumstances or certain dynamics in the environment in which I was um, surrounded by and living, I could change how I was treating myself. And that began the journey and formalized my education, built a private practice, uh, contributed to many books, wrote my own book, What the Fork Are You Eating? And uh, have sort of evolved and grown from there. 
thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, because I, I think, so I had an aha moment and I'm going to ask you what your, uh, like not, uh, I guess aha moments kind of corny, but like that light bulb or the moment that like you realize my question is going to be like, this was important for you to go on that track. And I know it, it's, it's not been easy because I know you and I have talked, but for me, nutrition, I think that like I mentioned the marathons, but there was, um, there was a clinical study that we had funded. Uh, there's a, a fantastic researcher at UCLA, and this was a combined project with UCLA and UConn. And it was very basic. Make mice obese and wait for cancer to. And this was back in like 2015. And this was the, oh shit, like the food we are eating is causing people to get sick. Mm-hmm. And I remember being at UCLA and talking to the professor and I said to him, I said, Hey, you, are you worried? <laughs> Cause like, this is like, this is to me at the time I was like, Oh my God, you know, this is like the, and the data, you know, again, the science proves that if you make mice obese, they get cancer mm-hmm. by eating like a high carbohydrated diet. And I said, are you worried? Like you may not show up to work tomorrow. Like I I was like being a little sarcastic, but I I wasn't, I was like, you know, there's a lot of people in the food industry that have a lot to lose. If people know, like if you eat these high carbohydrate, carbohydrated diets, like high carb diet that you're going to get sick. And he's like, well, that's, I'm here as a scientist to provide the data, how people interpret it and what people do with it. That's not really my, like my goal is to show what the data does. Right. Right. And put that data out for public consumption. So it was just kind of interesting. Um, he, he is still practicing. He is still doing wonderful research. Um, but it was just my moment that I was like, wow, man, food in this space in particular with cancer, which we're going to get into, but food as a whole, like, man. And, you know, at that point, 2015, I started to even look back at like my own personal experience with my dad and like start thinking like, cause like my dad, like and my mom cooked everything from scratch. I mean, we were first generation Italians. Like we didn't go like a treat for us was like going to get fast food. Like we never ate out. Like we, we never, 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 never ate out. Like I could probably have counted, like I didn't have certain ethnic foods and so I went to college you know as right. takeout like it just was it was just not the norm for us so I I just look back and you go wow man like was it diet was it this um you know so just kind of crazy you know that was my aha moment when it came to food but for you with your experience what was that moment for you where you were like oh man this is it so um I will answer that question in a minute, but I want to go back to what you were saying because it's really interesting. Um, First of all, carbohydrates get a bad rap, okay? There are plenty of really healthy carbohydrates out there. Kale is a carbohydrate, right? Uh, Brown rice is a carbohydrate. So I think part of the issue is that um, we as a society don't really understand what carbohydrates are, okay? Because Mm -hmm. there are blanket statements made there. Now, the other thing in terms of um, diet, you know, uh, uh, certain types of diet uh, causing cancer, I spent, you know, 20 plus years in private practice where I saw, I would say 80% of my clients over the years had cancer. Um, And that was mostly what I was working with. Um, And I will tell you that... uh, Based on that experience alone, yes, diet is a component, but there's intergenerational trauma, right? There's PTSD, um, there's work stress, there's environmental stressors, there's um, relationship stress, and there's so many different things that take whatever it is that we are predisposed to, because every human being is predisposed to something genetically, and and um, that leads us, all these factors are contributors. So that's why it's so important to step back and look at your life and evaluate your life and say, huh, how can I tweak that so it's less stressful for me? Because in the end, I will go back to Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. The body does keep the score, 
right? Mm -hmm. So we have a physical response for emotional trauma and we have an emotional response for physical trauma. And that is my strong belief system based on my own journey and based on the journey that I have been privileged, the journeys that I have been privileged to be a part of over the years. And I live with illness. I live with chronic illness, okay? So those early years, um, for me, being so sick, were also very telling, right? And I live with an autoimmune disease. I live with a kidney disease. And I always joke that if that's all that I'm walking away with from the things that I've experienced, then I feel pretty lucky because you know what? I can manage this. I can manage this and I will manage it. And that's part of the reason why I live so healthfully because I also don't have a choice, mm -hmm. right? But to answer your aha moment question, I think for me, um, my aha moment came because this is the way I've been for nearly 40 years. I'm I'm 54. So, you know, right around the age of 15 is when I started really looking at what I was eating and how I could do better. Um so for me it's just my way of life. Um but for me the aha moment came probably in about I want to say 2012, um, when I had gone to culinary school, I had uh, graduated from Columbia. I had birthed two children, boys, okay, who at the time were seven and four. And I was with my seven year old in an ice hockey rink on Long Island. And I had a a, a career at that point where I had a private practice. I had been asked to contribute to a book or two. Um, you know, I did some media, I did some speaking, some teaching. Um, and I was in the hockey rink with my, um, my seven-year-old at the time. And I was in the stand, he was on the ice and I was in the stands with my younger son. And I look down to my right because I hear a child hysterically crying and screaming. So I look down to my right and I see this kid in a stroller with his mother and he was crying. And the mother was fixated on her son on the ice. Mm. And I'm just observing. I'm like, huh, okay, does she not hear him? And then I see her reach into her diaper bag and pull out an empty baby bottle. With her other hand, she reaches in and pulls out a bottle of red Gatorade. And she poured the red Gatorade into the baby bottle, gave it to her screaming child, and continued to watch her other child playing hockey. And I stepped back and I was like, I mean, like, even when I talk about it, I get chills. My blood was boiling. And I was, I was infuriated and I, I just wanted to go to that woman and scream at her. But at the same time, I'm having this conversation with myself, who are you to judge another? You don't know what her story is. You can't go and scream at her. Okay. So Steph, what are you going to do about it? You have all this knowledge. You have people who have asked you, you've, you have people who have asked you to contribute to books. So what are you going to do? You're just going to hold on to this information. And that was my aha moment that, you know what? I'm going to go try to write a book of my own. And that's when I started on that journey. And I was very, very determined to get that book written. And with the support of an amazing agent, um, I was able to put together a pretty solid book proposal. Um, what people don't know is that book proposal was basically pre-sold to multiple publishing houses, but when it was read through by most of these houses, 
the response to my agent was, we love Stephanie. We love her voice. We love her credentials. But we've heard all of this before, and she's not a celebrity. And I was rejected at 30 publishing houses. 30. Because you weren't a celebrity? Or because well, of the content? I think because, you know, uh, people reading it thought that the information in there had been heard before, which it hadn't been um, in that kind of way. Yeah. And I wasn't a celebrity. They didn't, you know, who was I, right? Who was I? When you have people like, um, you know, Alicia Silverstone or Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, writing books about food and health and that's what sells. Yeah, buy a $40,000 cardigan sweater on Goop, right? Or whatever her gels. That's yeah, crazy. It's, it's altered values. And and then um, very thankfully, uh, several months later, I, you know, I was, you know, admittedly very depressed. And my agent called and she said, listen, honey, um, I have two publishing houses that are interested in you as an author, um, but they want a different book. Let's do a redirect. And I, I said, forget it. I'm not doing a redirect. I said, that's ridiculous. And you know what? I don't care. I'm done. And, um, and then one day I'll never forget. I was sitting at this table that I'm sitting at right now. And she called me and she said, you know, that redirect. I'm like, yeah. She goes, you need to do it right now because Penguin Random House wants to see the redirect. And I had to drop everything because they wanted to see it in a few days. And I had to write, uh, you know, a three page redirect, which honestly was, uh, I'd said to my agent, I said, all right, how about this? The 911 guide to about face your kids bad eating habits because you don't give a shit. So that's what I was doing is I was really feeling like snarky and really yeah. angry. Like you're kidding me. They want a kid's book. How am I going to solve these kids issues if I'm not solving the parents? Right. And so um, I wrote this redirect. And at the time I hosted a radio show on a local NPR station and I turned my phone on after our show recording and my agent kept calling through and I'm, I'm like, I don't want to talk to her. I'm done. Like I'm done. And, uh, I finally picked up and she's like, are you sitting down? Like what now? She said, Penguin Random House wants your original manuscript. They just offered you a deal. So, but the interesting thing is, is I haven't made a dime on the book. Why? So my agent said to me when I got into this, she said, babe, don't write a book to make money. And um, she goes, you write a book because you have something to say. And I go, okay, I have something to say. I don't care about the money. But because my book has not sold enough copies. So basically you get an advance, which because yeah. I wasn't, because I'm, I'm not a celebrity. Because you're not a celebrity, yeah. Is very small. And then, um, you know, all the books that you sell go back to them to pay right. that advance until you've paid back the advance. So well, we're we're gonna I'm gonna recommend that everyone buy the book who's listening to this podcast. So hopefully that will help. So <laughs> I, I, I just I, so, hope it helps people. That's really it. I don't, you know, I wrote this because I had something to say, and um, you know, I still do. So well, let's talk about the book here for a couple uh, minutes here. Yeah. So what the fork, wh why what the fork? Uh, was that the original title that, or was it something else? So funny enough, um, many years ago, there was a, a book that came out that you may remember. It actually came out in a PDF and it was sent around like wildfire to parents called Go the Fuck to Sleep. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. But no. look it up. It 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 sold out on Amazon before it even was released. Um, and now 
Uh, it's brilliantly narrated by Samuel L. Jackson. You can check the video out, but it was just brilliant. It was this whole idea that like as parents with young kids, they never sleep. And mm -hmm. like all you want to say to them is go the fuck to sleep. Mm -hmm. So it was just brilliantly done. And, you know, I was with a friend of mine and it, 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 we were talking about it and it made me really reflect on, you know, what I think when I see people making really unhealthy choices and, you know, I want to say, dude, what the fuck are you eating? Do you know what that does to you? But that's not my place. So I wanted to title the book, What the Fuck Are You Eating? Since that is not necessarily indicative of who I really am yeah. as one of my dear dear mentors and confidants and surrogate mom says to me, she's like, honey, I get it, but you're way too compassionate to call it. What the fuck are you eating? I yeah. said, okay, so then let's just call it. What the fork are you eating? And that's how it, it birthed. I love that story. So I, I I'm, we're not going to give everything away because I want audience to, to, to really in, to go out and buy the book, which we'll give later. There's plenty of ways to do that. And it's also an audio too at this point. So, you know, it's a lot to take in. But I, I want to share my own personal experience with this. So yeah. we had you come to our talk to our survivors. We had a mm -hmm. survivor summit back in September. You were gracious enough to share your time, talk to them about nutrition and some of the things that they could do, some of the things that were in the book. I started reading the book. I didn't read the book before the summit. I read the book after summit. I texted you the other day. I would go, I said, I'm going to read the text here because it's still on my phone. So bear with me here as I pull up the text <laughs> and our conversation. And I said, uh, get it there. So I said, okay, here we go. Reading through your book for prep, I may not eat anything anymore. Great, great read. So mind blowing. And I can't wait to talk. And so, and, and, you know, and, and I, I, I go back to what I said. So 2015, I had like that aha, like, oh my God, food. I did, I did vegan for a whole year uh, or plant-based, I should say, did plant-based mm -hmm. for a, a year and a half. I eliminated caffeine for like almost two years. I've done paleo when I was doing a ton of CrossFit, did that for like a whole year. So I thought I knew, and I, I think I know enough about nutrition, but then reading through the book, and I, I just want to like, some of this stuff's mind blowing to me. And I, I'm going to, we're going to talk about a couple of things. And I know the book is awesome because you start with like, Hey, things that you should know, things that you should avoid, things that you can do, things that better alternatives. And every chapter has that within that. Right. And right. You just don't give, you do give personal experiences, but you bring the science and the data. This is not Stephanie just flying off the seat of her pants. This is data driven, science driven, proven facts about these things that are ruining our food system. I'm going to use that term and I can use it. You can use another term. I but. think my professors at, at teacher's college would kill me if I didn't do science-based, right? So like I'm trained in that. Yeah. It, it, this is in the chapter about artificial flavors and enhancers. So for everyone, so my son, I have a 17, 18 year old son after every soccer game, what do they do? They go to McDonald's and I'm going to pick on McDonald's right now. I know you mentioned Burger King, but I'm sure the statistics are very similar. To give you an idea, in a Burger King strawberry milkshake, there are 63 flavor agents that are used to create artificial strawberry flavor found in a Burger King strawberry milkshake. So let's just talk, like anyone listening or watching thinks that a strawberry milkshake, regardless of where it comes from, that has 63 flavor agents is doing any good to anyone because the adage is like, well, they're young, like they can eat that stuff. They'll be okay. Have you looked at, at our middle school kids lately to see how obesity and 
kids that have diabetes type, not type one, but type two diabetes at 10 years old. Does anyone think that's a problem? But so 63 flavor agents. Uh-huh. I just, so I'm going to pick on this artificial flavors and enhancers. Please I saw do. Some, I saw something and then we're going to, we're going to move on here because there's other <laughs> stuff here. I, I, I saw this the other day. Okay. Uh, it was on TikTok. So, okay, TikTok police come after me here. But they're talking now about these chicken sandwiches and the chicken sandwich at the most popular chicken fast food. We're not going to mention names because I don't want them coming after me. But we know top, who it is. Yeah. They're about to open one about 20 minutes here in Connecticut from us. It's going to, I just saw it this morning. They're going to have a big grand opening next week. But there's the other one that used to be. It's named after a comic book hero Uh uh, that has another chicken sandwich. And they said there's like 200 ingredients in the chicken itself. And they took the, the, the ingredients off the internet because people started to question why these certain chicken sandwiches are so goddamn popular with everyone. Right. It's like an addiction. So it's, it's really interesting on, you know, and this is part of what, what my book tries to do, uh, or I try to do, um, because I, first of all, you know, one thing I want to say, which is really important uh, within the context of this conversation is that food is emotional and behavioral. Okay. And everybody has a different starting point. Right. And so my hope is that if you read my book or if you go to wtfork.com, if you take one or two small things away from what I am putting out into the universe, you're doing better. I'm not here to judge anybody. With that book or with the website, I'm just presenting facts. I'm also presenting um, ideas founded in logic, right? Mm -hmm. Just in pure logic. And I'll use an example. When my book came out and I went to my son, my older son's class to read an excerpt and to do a little smoothie experiment with the kids. There's an excerpt in the book called Cartoon Characters and Crappy Food. Mm -hmm. And uh, our food industry spends billions of dollars a year marketing ultra processed food to children. That's what they do. So I'm I'm reading this excerpt to these fifth graders and one kid raises his hand and says, so wait a second. If the in, if food industry knows that these ingredients are unhealthy, why are they putting them in our food? Oh, it's a pretty logical question, right? I didn't even have to answer. Another kid raises his hand and says, oh, well, they're doing that because they don't care about our health. They just care about making money. I'm like, another really logical and correct answer. Okay. And then we have another kid who says, well, and you know what? Hmm. They market that food to kids, but also to kids in lower income communities. Mm -hmm. Great observation. Okay. And then another boy raises his hand and this is where I almost fell off the chair. And he goes, my mommy buys me cases of Gatorade. If this stuff is bad for me, why is she buying it for me? And I just looked at him and I said, because your mommy doesn't know better. And that's why I had to write this book. So for me, I am not here to judge everybody else. Um, I am here to give you information. You know, like you said in that text that, oh my God, you're never going to eat again, right? Yeah. So many years ago, I was teaching, um, I used to teach these week-long workshops at Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health in Lenox, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, my colleague would do sort of a nutrition science uh, uh, program in the morning. And then I would do a culinary program in the afternoon and we would pair it together. 
And he's pretty radical in his belief system. He's brilliant. Um, so I, I get my students for the afternoon and one woman comes in and she's crying. And she said, oh gosh, after this morning, I just, I just don't know what to eat. And uh, Stephanie, I just, I don't understand, don't understand how you can eat knowing everything that you know. And I thought about that for a moment. And I said, it's a really good point. I said, but you know what? Knowing what I know actually makes me feel more in control because I can make educated choices. And then I can be a flashlight for everybody else in what is really a dark tunnel, right? So yeah. food is a dark tunnel in this country most specifically. And my book really looks at why, you know, it looks at the history of, of, you know, food industry and government. And it looks at the truth of how our food is regulated, how our food is labeled, what that is in comparison to what's going on in Europe. It's unbelievable that we are so archaic in how we do things compared to Europe. Well, I, I think this is a, a great point that you, you make here with the government. And so people might be offended by this, but I, I guess I relate this. Like, this is my point. Like the government, like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not, I, I'm not saying that here. Like there's some really, really good people that are, that are in office to do what is best for the greater good of all human beings, right? A hundred percent. But I always, I also say that, and this is what I've learned in, in 13 years in the cancer journey and, and, and relates to everything, uh, education, food, mm -hmm. like you can't assume that big industry or government is always going to do what's right for you, Right. So, um, and like, just like when patients call here and say, Hey, like, um, what are the things that I should know when, you know, going to the doctor and, you know, we give them a list of questions that they should ask because you right. yourself are your biggest advocate. It's a do not ask, do not get system. Right. And I think that is the case for, you can look in through education, you can do the medical, you can look through food, right? Like it may say organic, but do you know that? Organic doesn't mean what we think, what you may interpret as organic. Or I, I think, Steph, maybe the question is like, I think people like you need to understand like what that, what is truly organic? Like what is everyone's definition of organic? And I think media and corporate America have this, have this perception of organic is like, hey, the cow is in this field of grass, you know, it's eating grass. But, you know, if you if you really as you go in in your book, like you dial that down or, <laughs> you know, like that's not the case. It's in a pen. It's getting grain. It's not it, it, the last 30 days. It's it's eating crap and it's not moving out of a six by six box. That's still organic. Right. That could be yeah. the definition. I, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of probably not doing justice to that. But my point is here, I think people rely and I get it. Like everyone's got busy lives. But to your point, like food is important. And I think you said something very powerful before. And we, we kind of, I glossed over it, that relationship. And I know you've mentioned this to me personally, and you mentioned it as survivors. I think a big piece of this is like, what are everyone's individual relationship with food? Mm -hmm. That is so critical to this conversation about what we eat. Oh, critical. Right? But your book is excellent in the sense that it provides the data, the statistics, the science on what people should be looking out for. I think right. you mentioned this too in person is like, yeah, to eat this way, is it realistic for everyone? No. But I think everyone can do certain things to eat a healthier lifestyle, to eat better foods. So yeah. avoid driving through the drive through or giving the kids Gatorade because that's the simple off the shelf like, hey, that's easy. It's marketed that way. Um, 
I like to use a term, and, and I know this is maybe rough summing this up. If it was easy, everyone would do it, right? right. Um, but sometimes, right, but it is. So this is what's so interesting is that you know, if you were to tell me 10, 15 years ago that making healthier choices was a challenge, I would say, you know what? I feel for you. You know, I feel for you and I see that. But you know what? This day and age, even when we look at food deserts, right? Mm -hmm. There are options for healthier. There are. And listen, you know, it's uh, with this rise of sort of healthier eating, um, being more sugar conscious, you know, we've also, I always say these perils of progress, right? We have to think about, you know, okay, we're making progress and that, yes, it's, it's a broader dialogue, but what are the perils? Well, the perils are that you know, there's authentic, healthy, good for you. And then there's bullshit, healthy, good for you. Right. So now you have to really decipher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, we've got a lot of healthier fast food, but is it really healthier? So Let's give think, an example of that though. What what what's an example of that? Because I think that's important for the audience. Because I think we we could go. I, I'd love to give them an example of that. So when we think of sort of traditional fast food in this country, you know, you're thinking about McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we've we've had sort of this new age fast food of like a Panera, a Chipotle. Just salad. Right. Okay. And so what you have to look at, you know, just because you're in a salad place, for example, you still have the option to load it with blue cheese and bacon and creamy dressing and craisins and all this. <laughs> exactly. Granted, they have generally healthier ingredients. And I have spent years upon years on the road you know, eating at not some of the uh, original fast food places, but some mm -hmm. of the newer generation, um, needing to grab things, having, a, you know, a son who's gone that travel hockey route, right? So I have been in food deserts. I have been in many different, a lot of the things that um, people across the board could be dealing with. And I have a lot of sensitivities towards that. Um, and a lot of experiences where I have been able to break down barriers. And I just don't buy it when someone says to me, healthy eating costs more, or I can't eat healthy where I live. Mm -hmm. I am at the point in my journey, personally and professionally, with everything that I have done and everything I've seen that. I can call bullshit, right? And that is where I'm going to go to the emotional behavioral. And I'm going to say, okay, let's talk about why you can't. Mm -hmm. Okay, why are you creating these barriers for you? Is it lack of education? Let's get educated. I'm all yeah. for it. Is it lack of skills? I don't know. Come take a cooking class virtually if you want. Let's gain some skills. You know, if you want to learn from me and you can't afford to, shoot me an email. I'll figure something out for you. It has to do with the emotional behavioral component of how we connect to nourishment. We are what we eat. We are what they ate and how they were treated. And like I said, to 200 teenage boys speaking at a boarding school over a month ago, if you owned a Ferrari, what kind of gas would you put in the car? And they're all looking at me like I'm nuts. Premium. Of course we put premium in the car. Okay. Guess what, dudes? Your body is more valuable. In fact, priceless. Compared to a Ferrari. Why aren't you putting premium in your bodies? 
And they all looked at me like, hmm. We don't think that what we do today will have consequences tomorrow. We need edible accountability. And that is holding ourselves accountable for the choices that we make. I don't want anybody to be inflicted with pain or illness, particularly when you have the ability to control what you're putting in your mouth and eliminate that as a contributing factor. I love that term, edible accountability. Um, so I I, I want to shift here a little bit. We're going to talk about cancer here in a second, but something I, I attended a presentation a couple of weeks back and um, it was more on like, you know, avoiding illness, living longer uh, from a group down in Florida. I won't mention the name, but they were talking about um, eating a certain lifestyle. And, you know, similar to, I know you talk about the dirty dozen, but the question that aroused from that was, so I get it. Like, you know, we, we touched about this a little bit and it is in the book. I don't want to give the book all away, right? We want people to, to get the book, but you know, eggs, for example, you know, cage free again, this, this loosely defined definition by the governing bodies. And I think that the better term is to really understand where your food comes from, you know, your pork, your, your chicken, you know, and this goes into a lot of the topics in the book, you know, from GMOs to antibiotics, steroids, like, you know, why would you eat food that's been steroids like to me that's kind of crazy but like i was talking to my wife about that last night and i was like yeah think about it like right why why would you eat anything that has like an antibiotic in it right like it's kind of crazy so my question to you though for folks because homesteading i guess has been a big thing right like i know a couple of my employees have their own chickens and they feed them particular you know scraps which again then this goes into this other this this, like hamster wheel here because like if the scraps you're feeding are organic or have chemicals in them then the chickens are just eating that and then the eggs that are coming out yeah you may think that those are organic and cage free because they're roaming around your yard but then if you use fertilizer that has toxins in it well they're just ingesting that stuff right so i guess that this is like a really loaded question but If you're homesteading and you have your own chickens, you have your own cattle, does that really make a difference? Like, are you really, really clean eating because you're not factoring in all these other things that come into it, which is just kind of like mind blowing, like my head's about to explode. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, my first response is like, hey, you know, that is so not realistic for most of this country. So oh, let's just absolutely. put that out there. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, if you are homesteading and you you do have that as as an option, I don't, but if you do have that as an option, you know, you have the ability to to think about all those parts of of the process, right? So what are you feeding them? Um, you know, how are you slaughtering them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you have the choice to do it in the cleanest and most humane manner. Okay. Um, at that point, I would say you don't even worry about all the other stuff. You're doing an awesome job, you know? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, and 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 another thing too that I like to say um, to people, which it could be counterintuitive, like when you hear this come out of my mouth, um, but I really mean it. Um, nutrition analysis, right, leads to edible paralysis. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I want people to pick their battles, pick their broad strokes. My broad stroke is eating clean. I do not want chemical cuisine in my body, in my kids' bodies. I don't want it in my home. I don't want it in the people that I love and care about, although I have no control over that. Um, I only have control over myself and I have control over what I put out there. My book is really about that. 
right? About all the different things that are going into our food that don't have to be the way it is. And that there are options out there and that you, my reader, you have a choice. And I'm showing you with this book what the choices are. Please choose better. That's my plea, really. That's my plea. And so, you know, I'll never forget when my book first came out. And uh, uh, the very first um, discussion, public discussion I did with a book was here locally in Montauk. And a gentleman raised his hand and he said, so let me ask you something. Should I eat cauliflower raw, steamed, sauteed, baked, roasted? And he's going on and on. And I just looked at him and I go, I don't know. How do you like cauliflower? He goes, sauteed. I go, so then that's how you should eat it. He was concerned about the nutrient depletion in the cauliflower but he didn't like raw cauliflower. So don't eat it raw. You're going to get the health benefits, plenty of them, if you eat it sauteed, right? And then another woman said to me, okay, so um, what can't I eat? I said, yeah, my book isn't about deprivation. You can eat whatever you want. I just want you to make educated choices. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book is about. And so foundationally, foundationally. This book is intended for anyone who eats and we all eat. And it's intended for people who want to do a little bit better and understand what they're putting in their bodies day in and day out. And could you make better choices for yourself and for your loved ones? Probably. I know I could. I mean, I'm human. I know all of this stuff. And sometimes I still wish I could do better. So. I think what you just said is is so powerful because that's how I, I, you know, you summed it up great. It's a foundational piece, right? Um, You know, and and I think the, the, the edible paralysis that you said as well, like that's how you said that I was like, wow, man, that's how I was like reading through it. Right. Like you have this edible paralysis. And I think, um, you know, everyone's life is different. Right. And people, crazy lifestyles, whatever you do, you, as I say, um, do you, yep. I mean, there's, there's consequences for everything that we do. Right. And that goes from and what we're trying to say here is like what you put into your body, like you said, like the great analogy, like if you're a Lamborghini, like you don't put like 87 in that thing because it knocks. So same thing, like, you know, uh, actions have consequences, just like if you like to, I mean, there, there's so much data now, and this is what's just so great about the book is there's so much data in there that talks about these decisions and the things you're eating. But if we look at like, Hey, people go, Oh, like Elon Musk, he doesn't sleep. Well, there's data. Like, listen, if you don't sleep like eight hours a night and get high quality sleep, like your life expectancy goes down significantly. Yeah, God so bless can, Elon Musk. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, he can problem. do it. Yeah, yeah. Great. Right. Great for good him, for but him. not, not good for you, uh, for most of the people. Right. And we also know what alcohol, right? Like Drinking a lot more alcohol than someone who doesn't drink, there's consequences for that, right? Smoking, right? right? Like we can go down the list, I guess is my point here. What's great is that the data backs it up. You got the data in there and and it's really a foundational piece on food. I want to shift gears here and talk a little bit about cancer um, because I know you're doing some stuff now moving forward. Um, as we said in the beginning, like there is a there is a link. Um, the data is there. We're not just making this stuff up. Um, we've had people on the podcast um, that eat a certain way to get better results for chemotherapy. We even had a pharmaceutical company that was taking tumor DNA and RNA and then sequencing that and then coming up with certain diets that, in theory, um, with the data that they had work better with certain chemotherapy treatments. So again, we know diet benefits, 
people, um, I shouldn't say diet, but certain foods, I guess, is probably the better term. Yeah. When going through cancers, uh, lowering inflammation, um, giving you all sorts. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, given your experience, I know this is a deep rabbit hole, but maybe like we can stay high level, um, you know, what you've learned and what you've experienced, you know, with food and cancer. So, you know, I think I'm going to really just look at my, my client population over the years and, and what I have learned, you know, it's, um, always humbling to work with people who um, have been newly diagnosed with an illness, uh, cancer or other, and uh, being invited to take that journey with them. And I have to go in um, really just to listen and, and to listen and to see based on what I hear, how I can best help. Everybody has a different starting point. So for example, um, you know, the data supports that an anti-inflammatory diet is, uh, advantageous for anybody living with cancer or any other illness, which is founded in inflammation. So I will always support an anti-inflammatory diet. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean a diet that is comprised primarily of whole foods, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, um, high quality protein, uh, like fish primarily, right? Um, now that said, I can take that template and I can offer it up or want to offer it up to the people I am working with. But at the same time, it may not be effective. It may not be effective because everybody has a different narrative, you know? Um, And my job is, is to understand that. So, um, and they also have different uh, socioeconomics, different access issues. And I have to look at all that. And I have to say, what can they do within the context of their lives? And what are they willing to do? Because there's also a willingness. There are people that I have, have been exposed to and worked with um, who get diagnosed, who just want to eat the way they want to eat. And they don't, they don't really care otherwise. And, um, they have to accept that, you know, and I have to accept that. And, um, you know, in my, you know, deeply personal experience, which, uh, was probably one of, uh, the hardest lessons for me is, uh, a year ago, my 51 year old cousin passed of pancreatic cancer. And, um, she really didn't want to do a whole heck of a lot with food. And I came in to help her and did everything that I could. And I know that I helped her, but it was very hard because I wanted her to do more. And I had to respect that she wanted to do what she could do. And everybody around her had to respect that. And um, so when it comes to dietary recommendations, specifically, it's anti-inflammatory. Sometimes it's pre-digested foods. If the, if the pancreas, if the pancreas is impacted um, or digestion is impacted, um, it's, the type of consistency of the foods that that you're recommending. Um, Sometimes you're dealing with sores from treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Nausea from treatment. And so I'll look at what kinds of foods would be supportive and helpful for that. And, you know, I'm always looking at the current research when I'm in a situation like that and also turning to colleagues of mine who have done a lot of work in this space so, uh, and have written books about food and cancer. So Rebecca Katz being one of them, and she wrote a book, uh, called one bite at a time, the, the cancer fighting kitchen. 
Um, so there's some really great books out there that are very, very helpful. Um, but I think that, I mean, that's a, it's, it, listen, it's a rabbit hole. Like you said, Dino, yeah. I, I, I think that I, I mean, I hope that I've answered it sufficiently. No, I, 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 I love it. I, I think it's very powerful. I, I think, you know, I wish, and again, I speak from experience in 13 years, the, the space, the system, I should say, the system just doesn't give give enough support to patients and their families, right? And so I think this is like a rabbit hole, yes, or whatever we want to call it. It's just this piece of fighting cancer and not just, I know we do everything pancreatic cancer, but cancer as a whole Mm -hmm. that the system just doesn't support. And I just look back again, I use my personal experience, like my dad, like the nutritionist came and was like, okay, like try to get more protein. And I'm like, okay, like everything he puts in goes through him. So like, yeah, that way we're going to put like a chicken breast in front of him. You know, there's just not, the conversation is just isn't there. And and it's a, it's a systemic issue. Um, deeply, I don't think- deeply systemic, like deeply. deeply. You have Correct. you have doctors who get no nutrition training, limited no. to no, statistically speaking. Okay, I think they get. Um, I think the data is four hours of nutrition training in medical school. Okay, and then you have nutritionists who go to school for nutrition and no. do not necessarily study food and culinary from a food as medicine perspective. Correct. So go figure, go it, figure. It, that's, it's, yeah. That's why it, I had to do what I do. I mean, I literally, you know, and I think I may have told you this going back to this aha moment, you know, cause I did have another aha moment prior to that hockey rank one, which was, uh, I was just graduated from culinary school. And I thought that I was going to maybe open up a a, like a healthy eating joint where I could bring people Mm -hmm. in and nourish them and educate them. And and I was back at uh, school for a dinner one night. Um, uh, We did these public dinners, so I was chefing a dinner, and and it uh, we were on. I was I was on my prep day actually, which was a Thursday, and I one of my teachers came over to me and she's like, "Listen." I need your help. I I need to speak to a group of women with cancer up at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. And uh, I just got a call. My babysitter canceled. I have to go home to New Jersey. And she's like, I, I said, so what? Yeah. I, I, I don't, why are you asking me? And she said, well, because you, you can do the talk. And I'm like, no, nah, Roberta, I can't do the talk. I'm, I'm not, no way, man. I was like, I, I'm not, I'm not qualified. She said, yes, you are. You're going to go do the talk. You don't have a choice. And it was like, I did not have a choice in that moment. And I accepted. And I went up and I'm standing in front of 40 women with cancer at St. Luke's Roosevelt talking about a whole foods diet. And as I'm doing this, I'm like, I am so, I'm having this out of body experience where I'm like, I am so unqualified to do this. Oh my God, this is what I need to be doing but I'm so unqualified. Oh my God, maybe I need to go back to school. You're not going back to school. You're 31 years old. And this is going through my head. And I left that moment and I was like, nope, I got to go back to school. I got to go back to school. And I was the only chef that ever, back in 2000, when I started at teacher's college, they had never had a chef go through their nutrition program. Hmm. But I was determined. I'm like, I got to get the credentials. I got to be believable. I've got to be based in science. You know, I I, I can't be spewing bullshit. I've got to be yeah. spewing fact. Fact. Yeah. Well, the data doesn't lie. Right. Um, and so, and that's what I, I love about the book here. So I got, Couple questions left, and then we're going to share where people can learn more. And, yeah. and I know you're about to roll out some really exciting stuff on your website, which by the time that this podcast comes out, it'll probably be out. So, when it comes to food, and this these next couple of questions are really loaded. I always say there's no right or wrong. It's given your experience and what you've mm-hmm. gone through. 
What are some of like the worst decisions people can make when it comes to food? That's a super loaded question, but yeah. your experience, your answer. Okay. Some of the worst decisions that the, the top worst decision that people can make is, is to believe that a product that says zero sugar or low sugar or no sugar is actually healthy in any way, shape, or form. It's not. Okay. These products are sweetened with artificial sweeteners, which have, you know, consumption consequences. Okay. Um, another really bad decision um, or bad choice is believing what the product is telling you on the banners and other parts of the box or the package, the ingredients tell the story of your food. So turn it around and read the ingredients. Never, ever, ever believe all of that stuff. Um, and then I think the, the other thing, God, there's so many, but, um, you know, there's a lot that has to do with labeling. So that was sort of the tip of the mm -hmm. iceberg, but that goes across the board from animal foods to cereals. Okay. Um, and then I think the, the third thing would be sort of my, um, my ode to parents. Do not prohibit your child from helping food shop, from being in the kitchen. I know it's more work. Believe me, I've got two boys who are now 15 and 18. And um, my sanity was nearly destroyed because I let them grocery shop with me and put groceries away all in the wrong place and get in the kitchen with me at a very young age. Cooking is my calm. Food is my calm. It became chaos. Hmm. But that didn't stop me. And I beg of you not to let it stop you. Because by allowing your children to take part in nourishment from a very young age, you are setting the stage for positive connection to food. So awesome. that's it. Uh, true or false? Moderation is key. So in all of this, if you only eat like, you know, Captain Crunch once every two weeks, that's better than, you know, eating it every day. And I'm using- 100%. A hundred, a hundred percent true. You know, I had a client many years ago, she had gestational diabetes, um, for, with both her children and she was high risk for, you know, becoming a full blown diabetic. Uh, the interesting thing is she was highly intelligent. She had beautiful food in her house, but she drank three bottles of Coke a day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? three bottles of Coke a day, seven days a week. So I just looked at her and I said, could you cut it down to five days a week? She was like, yeah, okay. A month later, could you cut it down to four within a year? She wasn't drinking Coke anymore. My last question here, and we always have, this is a little bit different for, for you here, but we always ask people to define something and I'm going to make it relevant to you and your experience. There's no right or wrong. This is your answer. How do you define the term food? Food, food to me is defined by that which truly nourishes you with purpose. 
I'm all about purpose, right? So, um, you know, like I always say to my kids, for every problem, there's a solution. Think about what you say. Think about what you do. Let that have purpose. Food is here to help us. It's purposeful. So to me, food is nourishment with purpose. Awesome. Last thing here, Stephanie, for our audience listening at home, we want them to go learn more about What the Fork, purchase What the Fork, follow you. I know you've got a uh, your website coming out. You've got some amazing content coming out. But where is the best place for people listening, watching to, to connect, learn more, and yeah. just get more information on what you're doing? Thank you, Dino. So uh, inspired by inspired by my book is wtfork.com, the no BS roadmap to healthier choices. On that website, you can join our community for no charge. Uh, you can read through recipes and features and and bookmark and sort of have your own profile, your own space. Um, you can also, you can take courses. So we have a signature course that is um, five hours right now. Uh, part one and part two has been released of uh, Come Cook With Me in My Kitchen. And it's a learning process. Um, it's done in stages. You are to move at your own pace. So you can buy that. You can take workshops, which we're launching um, very soon. Our first one is going to be Navigating Cancer. It's a virtual cooking workshop from my kitchen to yours. Um, and we're doing that uh, in honor of and support of Project Purple. Um, but we're going to be holding two a month. And uh, there's personalized nutrition. We also have a membership for all of this, a yearly membership that comes with a variety of things, including a private Facebook group where um, you can dialogue directly with me. Um, so I urge you to go to wtfork.com, check it out, follow us on social media at wtfork official. Um, and you can also, you know, find me at stephaniesacks.com, you know, but that's, that's not as robust and active as wtfork. I love it. I love it. Well, Stephanie, thank you for being a guest on the Project Purple podcast. Thank you for all you're doing, uh, for the community as a whole with sharing this information. And I think one of the things uh, I mentioned a lot of things. And for me, like this is this is so awesome, the book, um, your website, all the content. And you know, there's a lot going on in the world today, right? I mean, there's so much. I mean, we we could go down so many rabbit holes here. <laughs> Not yep. rabbit holes, just you can go down so many different directions, right? Yeah. Yep. But I, I think that what you know, this relationship that we have with food is so critical. So um, critical. So to have someone like yourself, who is the super, I'm going to call you the super advocate about eating healthy and eating this lifestyle. And, you know, the, I said it before, like the choices that we all make. Yeah. Okay. You can make those choices and I'm not here to judge by all means. This is not what this is about, but the data shows and the science shows that those choices have consequences. So, yep. you know, this is a great guide. It's a great, you know, a lot of the things that I read through, like, you know, I was saying to myself, like, yeah, I've heard about that, but it's like this, this reinforcement that we need. Sometimes yeah. you need that reinforcement. So thank you for having the courage and for what you're doing for the community as a whole. And for it's super special what you're doing for the cancer community, because as we said, this is not part of that dialogue. And I've always said this podcast is all about putting out positivity. Yeah. What what people do with the data and what people learn from it, that's up to everyone. We're not forcing 100%. anything down anyone's throat, but like we're putting it out there and people need to be informed about this because your doctor and your nutritionist are not going to give you this information. Um, no. and, and that's just life that, that no matter what, and not do, because they don't care, it's correct. because they don't know that's not necessarily their wheelhouse. Correct. So, you know, as I always say, when you get diagnosed with illness, you get hired for the full-time job that you just don't want to have, but guess <laughs> what? You have it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, 
as I, as, as, as my friends and I joke, you know, put your big girl panties on and, you know, put one foot in front of the other. Powerful stuff. Stephanie, thank you for being a guest on the Project Level Podcast. You know, thank you. And thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you liked today's episode, please share this episode and follow the Project Purple Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Thanks for listening. And until next time, be safe.